Oops, record, resume recording. Okay, there we go. So welcome to the roundtable launch of this existential toolkit for climate justice educators um, sponsored by the Rachel Carson Center. I'm Sarah Jaquette Ray, one of the conveners of this event along with Jennifer Atkinson and Ellen Kelsey. I'm author of a new book called A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety, which just came out in April, in addition to several books on environmental justice. I'm a professor of environmental studies uh, at Humboldt State University in the Redwoods of far Northern California in a town called Arcata or Gudini in traditional Wiat language, as I'm a settler on unceded Wiat land. I try to imagine all of the places you're all joining from and honor the shared global legacies of colonialism and environmental disruption that now bring us together in this virtual space. I'm excited about how many of you can contribute to decolonial and anti-racist pedagogies in this existential toolkit. And I commit in my own work to making connections between climate, COVID, colonialism, and of course, white supremacy. I want to thank the Rachel Carson Center for supporting this workshop. And I also wanna thank um, Anna, who's joining us um, on this event from the University of Washington, uh, the technology help that she's helping us with today for her Zoom support. Um, at the Rachel Carson Center, Andreas Junger and Maximilian Newman uh, were extremely helpful on the technology and I wanna really lift up their names here. We want to acknowledge the silver lining that our online format over the next few days is allowing us to include far more people from our original round of applications that we would have ever been able to have all in Munich today. So this is a real silver lining and, a, and um, I'm really excited about that. The purpose of our gathering here is threefold. First, to connect you all to each other over a set of shared concerns to build a network. Second, to create the beginnings of an existential toolkit, which will be hosted on the Rachel Carson Center site and be public facing. Third, to identify next steps and knowledge gaps. All of the activities from our lightning videos to this round table to the breakout sessions are designed to advance those goals. The workshop's primary tangible outcome will be a climate educator's existential toolkit. But of course, a secondary purpose here is to create a space to cult cultivate a global network of people working on these things. So we're motivated to come together over a set of questions that we all share. How can educators, activists, and community leaders help students navigate the emotional impacts of ecological degradation and social injustice in the age of climate disruption? What emotional, spiritual, psychological, and existential tools do our students need as they prepare to take up the difficult work ahead? How do we teach at the intersection of heart, hand, and head and cope with students and our own emotional relationship to this material? And under the current conditions of the COVID crisis, organizing against police brutality and the global movement for black lives, what are we to do, as, what are we called to do as educators? How do we teach and learn in the midst of this rupturous moment in history when these interconnected phenomena are redefining what we even mean by climate justice? Many of us ourselves are on the front lines of racial violence and resistance, climate disruption, coronavirus vulnerability, and the dismantling of institutions of higher education. What is needed for us to show up authentically with our students so that we are resourced by teaching instead of drained by it? We may not answer all of this in the next two hours or the next few days, but our hope is that this is just the beginning of the conversation. Our breakout sessions tomorrow will result in both a list of tools for our toolkit, a harvest of all the expertise in the room, if you will, as well as a brainstorm of ideal next steps and knowledge gaps to be filled. If you're interested in joining a breakout session tomorrow, you need not register in advance. I sent an email yesterday with all of the Zoom links and times. So pick a time that works for you and just join. If you need that information again, we'd love as many participants as possible. So please let me know and I'll send you that email. Um, two other ways to participate are also available as the desire and your capacity allow for you. You can create a two minute lightning video still which is available on the Rachel Carson Center website. There's all the videos that have been done so far are really exciting and inspiring. Um, I recommend you check, take a look at them. And if you're in inspired, by all means, um, let me know and I'll send the instructions for how to 
produce and submit a video. And so without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to Jennifer Atkinson to describe the log logistics of how to communicate and how the agenda for today is gonna to go. Thank, Thank you. you. So um, again, my name is Jennifer Atkinson. I'm one of the co-organizers for this Existential Toolkit project. I'm an associate professor in environmental humanities at the University of Washington um, and the host of Facing It, a podcast on eco-grief and climate anxiety. And I'm joining you today from Seattle, which is the occupied land of the Duwamish people. Um, and in addition to the thanks that, uh, that Sarah paid to, to everyone who's helped bring this, um, bring this project together, I also wanna thank all of you who are joining us today and who've contributed to this project and stuck with this process as it's transformed in response to all of the, the turbulence and opportunity of 2020. Um, I'm just gonna give a quick overview of the webinar and a few administrative details. If you do have technical trouble or questions, as Sarah mentioned, Anna Thompson um, from UW ID, uh, U University of Washington uh, IT Services has, um, has joined us. So you can post your issue in the chat feature and she'll try to help. Keep in mind, she's only one person wearing many hats here. So perhaps others in the group can help you as well. And if for some reason you get disconnected and you, you cannot log back in, um, you can email us and we'll forward it to Anna, but again, we'll be fairly busy. So if you can first try to troubleshoot those problems on your own, that would, that would be ideal. Um, the main way that we're gonna ask you to participate is in the second hour, we'll have a Q&A and we want to give participants uh, two options for, for joining that. If you would like to um, not be unmuted or not be live on video, you can enter your question into the Q&A um, feature and Sarah and I can, um, can surface your questions. Um, but we would very much like to, to, to see some faces and hear your voices as well. Um, so if you raise your hand and that feature will either be at the bottom of your screen or if you're using a, a smartphone or a tablet, it's probably at the top of the screen, raise your hand and we will, um, when your turn comes up, we'll unmute you, which will make you live in the webinar. So you could ask the question yourself. Um, so with that, um, it is an honor for me to introduce our panelists today. There are six speakers, so I don't wanna overwhelm you with all of their bio information up front, and I'm gonna let them fill in any missing details as each speaker's turn comes up. But in alphabetical order, we have joining us first, Leslie Davenport, a climate psychology educator and a consultant on faculty, uh, faculty oh, I'm sorry, she's a climate educator and consultant on the faculty of the California Institute of Integral Studies. She's the author of three books, including Emotional Resiliency in the Era of Climate Change. And she has a new book on climate resiliency coming out for eight to 12 year olds. Second, we'll be hearing from Ellen Kelsey, faculty in the School of Environmental Studies at the University of Victoria, Canada. She is a spokesperson, scholar, and educator in the area of hope and the environment. Third, joining us from very, very early in the morning is Matthew Kamakani Lynch, Director of Sustainability Initiatives for all 10 campuses of the University of Hawaii system. Next is um, Panu Pinkala, Professor of Theology and Multidisciplinary Environmental Studies at the University of Helsinki, specializes in eco-anxiety and ecological emotions. Then fifth, we'll hear from Francis Roberts Gregory, PhD candidate in society and environment at the University of California, Berkeley. She's actually joining us today from New Orleans where she lives. Um, and she is an environmental sociologist and black feminist anthropologist with an interest in geography among many other things. And finally, joining us from Shanghai, uh, close to midnight, is Yuan Yuan, Assistant Professor at University of Shanghai for Science and Technology. Her primary fields are American Literature, Spatial Literary Studies, and Environmental Humanities. And Yuan is currently working on a study of American climate fiction in the 21st century. So we've given our panelists a very open-ended prompt for this roundtable. The question is, what are the one or two key messages from your research or work area that we must amplify in this age of crisis and transformation. So with that, I will hand it over to 
our first panelist, Leslie Davenport. Thank you and greetings everyone. And I also just have to start from a place of gratitude. Um, just all the hard work that I know has gone into creating this forum, uh, especially Sarah, Jennifer, Ellen, the Rachel Carson Center. And it's also thrilling to see all of you who are, who are able to join and be part of this. So uh, I've been a licensed psychotherapist for close to 30 years, and I am currently focusing on climate psychology. Um, and I want to <clears throat> present just two perspectives in this brief time uh, and assure you that there are going to be some written um, resources available to you that boil it down to practicality and how to apply some of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so the two points are related, and the first one is understanding what emotional resiliency is and why it's essential to climate justice work. Uh, the second point is about the importance of activating other ways of knowing than we normally rely on, other forms of intelligence that go beyond our usual cognitive minds because there's information that's just not accessible to the particular portals of our um, cognitive minds, the way they're set up to work. And a lot of these other areas that are essential have become somewhat dormant in much of our society, but the good news is that they can be reactivated. So starting with emotional resiliency, uh, what is it? Uh, most psychologists traditionally define it as the capacity to bounce back after a stressful event and return to normal. However, when we're looking at climate change and social justice issues relevant today, we have to define it in a different way um, because there is no returning to normal. There are rapid changes, multiple losses, considerable uncertainty as we glance into the future. And just as importantly, maybe more so, we don't want to return to life as normal because it is the social justice issues that is bringing to light how the roots of environmental degradation are built into a dysfunctional, unsustainable system within our society, businesses, politics, and the ways that we think. So we need to be prepared to navigate well. We need to be equipped to navigate uncharted territory. So I'm referring to emotional buoyant, uh, resiliency in a different way. It's how to sustain a quality of emotional buoyancy, a kind of readiness to respond in many different ways. It means remaining flexible, attentive, creativity is really important. It's the capacity to stay present with empathy, strong-hearted, clear-minded, not just in quiet moments of reflection, but while being fully engaged and even in the face of severe challenges. And there are many kinds of practices and many sources that can help us cultivate this that come from wisdom traditions, mindfulness, neuroscience, within psychology, especially what we can learn from somatics or body-based practices. Um, and because of the multiple complex losses, we can learn a lot from trauma-informed perspectives. One concept that helps put this larger theory into a, a more bite-sized way of understanding it is what's called the zone of resilience or the window of tolerance. And the basic idea is that we all have this kind of zone within which we can operate pretty well much of the time. When we're within our own window of tolerance, we can receive and process and integrate information pretty well. Um, meet challenges fairly effectively. But in times of extreme stress, when there's too much going on, when we begin to feel overwhelmed, we move outside of that zone. And one of two things usually happens. We either get very reactive and lash out, or we tend to shut down and withdraw. 
and it, there's a bunch of reasons why we might do one or the other, but it's a natural survival function to move, move away in one way or another. Um, so it's helpful not only to recognize where your edges are in, the, in your window of tolerance, your zone of resilience, but what I think is even more exciting and important is to know that we can stretch our window of tolerance. There are ways to cultivate a capacity to be present with more. And I think this is especially needed in uh, climate change and social justice work. And just to be really clear, emotional resiliency goes hand in hand with action. Um, if we just cultivated emotional resiliency without follow through, it would be quite self-indulgent. If we're just doing our action work without emotional resiliency, we can get overwhelmed, we can burn out, uh, we can get reactive, and the work ends up becoming much less effective. And there's a real beauty in here that was referred to a little earlier on. So this opportunity is born out of necessity, out of crisis, um, but it gives us the opportunity to really awaken and engage more of what it means to be human. We use such a small percent of our capacities. And because we function out of balance, it's no surprise that the structures we create are out of balance too. And it really is bringing together this inner and outer, a chance to do what we need to do as we dive deeper into who we really are and what's possible. So some of you who are in this field may know that this time has been called by some the great turning or the great work. There's a potential to approach this as really a transformative time. And that's partly why it's so exciting to see a forum like this um, bringing these, not just theories, but practices into education, into the community. And so, of course, this ties in very closely to other ways of learning. Um, so in addition to kind of the emotional intelligence that I've been referring to, we do need to keep our clear-mindedness going. There's a lot of ways to dismantle dysfunctional stories in our cognitions, uh, to learn from our bodies, to really cultivate the intuitive and creative, the relational, um, to value our diverse social capital that we can build. We need to remember how to listen to our bodies and rediscover the ears that can listen to the earth. So this kind of curiosity and creativity help us to be surprised because we're recognizing things outside of our usual worldview and our mental habits. Helps us envision what's possible to think outside the box because secret is there really is no box. And, um, you know, our cognitive analysis is valuable, but it works by dividing things up and by analyzing. So if we bring that with the creative intuitive, that works completely the opposite way. It's synergistic, it's a big view. It helps us connect the dots. It helps us synthesize things. And like that famous quote that's often attributed to Einstein, you know, we can't solve our problems with the same kind of thinking that created them. So I'm happy to provide this quick overview, but I'm a very practical person and uh, I'm looking forward to the opportunity of um, making these kinds of practices available, uh, distributed and practiced together uh, in the classroom and in the community. So I think I'll pause there. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Ellen Kelsey. Here we are. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be here, and I, I reiterate my gratitude, especially to those who are joining us in a language that is not their first language and in such different time zones. I really appreciate that effort. Um, I'm going to jump right in by sharing my screen. I think I can do that here. And I'm going to
So what I wanted to touch on in my, um, in my seven minutes here, and I'll just start my timer so I know, um, is really this idea that of, of thinking a lot about that stories change. And that a lot of times when we're talking about climate change issues, uh, we can find ourselves falling into narratives even without recognizing them. The number one way that most of us learn about the environment is actually through the media. And almost all of the media that we hear about the environment is, is negative. Uh, we hear about problems that exist. Um, headlines like this are not unfamiliar to you. And you'll notice in all of these slides, I've included a timestamp because I think it's helpful, very important in fact, to be thinking about what time are we talking about these. So this is a headline from 2019. What we end up with, therefore, is a narrative of gloom and doom. And that narrative of gloom and doom is just so tightly tied to how we think about the environment and climate change specifically that sometimes we don't even recognize it. The outcome of that narrative uh, is all kinds of different issues. Uh, this is just a partial list, and I know many of us today will be talking about different aspects on this list. But these are issues that we've tried to name because we recognize their impact on both children and adults. This is the point that I think is really important, is decoupling the enormity of the crisis from this narrative of hopelessness that comes along with doom and gloom, and really recognizing the difference between the two. Um, we have massively important global issues to deal with, and the way we talk about them impacts our feelings. So we have both the reality of the situation and we have our thoughts and beliefs and mindsets and they all can, they both contribute to how we how we feel about the, what's going on. And I just wanted to give one example to, to really show this. So um, not so long ago, we saw this headline, you know, we, we are in the midst of seeing the largest decline um, in greenhouse ga gas emissions that we've seen um, in, in recorded time. And yet the headline is, it's not good news, you know? And the reason this headline, and this is not a unique headline, this is really how that um, report was covered in major newspapers all over the world, is because of a comparison to what happened the last time we were in a massive financial crisis. So back in 2008, we saw this references to Canada, but in other countries as well, this rebound, uh, you know, so we saw a drop in emissions, which was much smaller than the drop in emissions we're currently experiencing. Um, but this belief in a rebound. So my point is 2008, that's a heck of a long time ago. That's 12 years ago. And when we jumped into these fatalistic beliefs about, okay, what happened last time is going to happen this time, they become the story. Now, a lot happened since 2008. If we just look back in 2019, we know that we saw the largest uh, protests ever for climate change. We saw climate emergency statements being declared by faith-based leaders, by First Nations, by states and local governments all over the world. In fact, by the end of 2019, this is where we were. So where are we in 2020? Well, we've, we've got that momentum sitting behind us. And in fact, um, recent reports, so this one coming out just in April, show that this commitment to climate change and the recognition of its, if its crucial importance is, is still high. It's still very high. And what people are really asking for is that the economic recovery that comes out of COVID-19 be a, a green recovery. And I think what's exciting and important to keep track of with our students and with ourselves is that um, it's not just the normal um, environmental organizations that are calling for that green economy. This is from a massive study that was just released showing that, you know, central bankers, G20 finance ministers and academics from 53 countries are saying the way out of these economic crises is, is a green recovery. And so I think it's it really falls to us as educators um, to be really thinking about how our story is changing. What are the emerging trends that are going on right now? And how do we place students so that when they are thinking about climate change, they are able to separate their very real emotional responses to the, the very real problems we face 
with a more current state of play about how other actors are responding in very similar ways that they are, or different ways too. I think this all falls to uh, the importance of hope. So often when I talk about hope, people think I'm talking about this, some Pollyanna wishful thinking that, you know, all will be well. So that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm really talking about is ideas about hope that are faced within the realities of the situation, a really clear eyed view, you know, what is the state of play and accepting this fact of not a fatalistic belief, but accepting that we, we don't know what's going to unfold. There are multitude responses. And yes, we should look at trends in the past so that we are informed in our work, but, but not take those fatalistic ideas as a foregone conclusion. I think the important work that we have to do as climate justice educators is take real world solutions that are actually happening and make them much more accessible and shareable. Because when we look in mainstream media, we know um, the international Society of Environmental Journalists, for example, reminds us of how little of that work is solutions oriented. A lot of the reports we see are very good jobs of telling us about the problems. So how do we make these solutions more accessible? Oops, my screen has decided not to move. Oops, let me go back one, two. Um, just in the last 10 years, uh, there has been a real rise in what's called solutions journalism. It's a movement, it's a network. The Solutions Journalism Network is uh, very available. And what I've been thrilled to watch is how they have put a huge emphasis on story coverage of climate change. And what Solutions Journalism is talking about is not just covering good news, but rather using the same critical um, eye that we would use to investigate problems, to investigate solutions. What about them is working? In what context? What is generalizable? What is specific to that place? So it's putting as much emphasis on what's broken as, as, yeah, as you would put on what's, uh, what's working. And in the last year, a uh, large focus has been on climate change and what's happening around the planet in terms of solutions. And then this year, a uh, major stream going out to COVID-19 and as well to anti-racial work. So I think when we look at sites like this that allow us to find materials that are relevant and current and are being brought from newslet outlets all over the world, and we involve students in seeing not only what's broken, but others who are concerned about the things they are and what's happening in real time, I think that's where hope comes in. And I think that's a really important part of our work as climate justice educators. So I'll just stop there and I'll unshare my screen. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, our next panelist is Matthew Kamakani Lynch. Aloha. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to start with just a quick screen share here. It's wonderful to be here today with you all. And before I start with my brief contribution. I'd like to welcome you all and respectfully offer a land acknowledgement. Um, we are calling in and joining each other from all across the world today, and yet we show up as faces in screens here. Um, so wherever you are, um, just pause for a moment and let's remind ourselves that we each exist on land, not, not only in cyberspace. Take a moment and look out of a window. Take a deep breath and sense your connection to the place that you are in. A place which nurtures you with clean air, clean water, healthy food, sunshine, and some of your most treasured relationships. My name is Matthew Kamakani Lynch and I am speaking to you from my home in Kaimaki, in the Mo'o of Kalahu, the Ahupua'a of Kapahulu, in the Moku of Kona, on the Mokupuni, of Oahu in the Paiaina of the Hawaiian Islands. And I recognize Hawaii as an indigenous place and ask us all to honor all indigenous peoples who are the ancestral descendants of the places we are in, who have lived, played, laughed, loved, taking care of these places for generations upon generations. Where I am, generations of native Hawaiians and their indigenous ancestral knowledge systems have shaped Hawaii in ways that are so beyond sustainable that allow my community to enjoy these gifts even today. And for 
this and so much more I'm grateful. As a fourth generation settler in Hawaii, who myself am descended from a long line of peoples in displacement from the islands of the Philippines, Ireland, and Scotland, from the indigenous ancestral roots and the intimate relationships with those specific places that today I find myself severed from. I seek to support the indigenous peoples of Hawaii to protect their land and their communities. And I understand that my own survivability and potential thrivability is intertwined with the ability of native peoples everywhere to flourish once again. And I'm committed to dedicating time and resources to working in solidarity for my own individual and for our collective healing. And I am grateful for each of you who have taken time out of your busy schedules to pause, listen, commune, and learn more from each other about additional ways that we might be able to take personal action towards transformation, which current events affirm are needed now more than ever. And the path which brings me here today begins with some questions that my colleague, Dr. Krista Heiser and I set out to explore about three years ago when we embarked on a two-year student focus group across our campuses. And we basically went, listened to students in a series of open-ended focus group discussions in our attempts to understand what students know, think, do, and feel about climate change and sustainability. And what we really left was this massive sense of dissonance that students had experienced. There's some key insights that we also gleaned that have helped us give us direct information to inform strategic tactical interventions that we can design that meet students in their context, at their context, meet students where they're at. One interesting insight was where students learn about climate change and related issues. And I'll give you a wild guess as to what the first source of information was. Our previous speaker, um, Ellen, gave us a plot spoiler there. Media, <laughs> actually, but even before media, and this really amazed us, was that 20 something year old students were telling us that in their lived experience, in their short lifetimes, they had a direct experience that they relate to climate change. We heard stories like the beach that we fished at as a family when I grew up is not there in the same way that it was and all kinds of really poignant, sometimes heartbreaking stories. Their lived experience was the number one source of where they had learned about this hyper object, this unfolding crisis of climate change. And then media being the second, different types of media, active media being the media that's algorithms are pushing content towards you. And you'll know dead last was from college faculty. The bright spot here was when they talked about college faculty, they would talk about specific professors that had had deep, meaningful, impactful um, influences on their, on their lives. This is the dissonance that I was sharing about earlier. Overwhelmingly, we found that students are experiencing these really strong emotions, conflicting emotions, but they're predominantly emotions of anger, fear, sadness, and shame, and a little bit of hope. We started to describe it as a fragile hope that was really dependent on literally their lived experience of that day. And this led us to think about how can we shift this dissonance to resonance? When a student comes to our campus seeking to be nurtured and seeking to equip themselves with skills and knowledge that's relevant to their futures, how can we shift this dissonance that they're sharing with us into relevance and perhaps even resonance? Could we create paths of cognitive reson resonance as they physically came up and walked and engaged to the class, um, with the campus and got to their classroom? This slide here is from a related survey um, that we administered electronically to our largest campus. And while 
it's probably not surprising that 95% of the students reported that they were either concerned or very concerned about climate change issues. What was really fascinating is look on the left hand side of this graph and you can see specific departments, specific disciplines and the levels of concern that students are reporting. So in our trade schools, our professional schools rather, which are the darker blue um, highlights towards the left, there are lower levels of concern that are being reported. And so it leads us to wonder, is this because those schools, our schools are equipping our students with such confidence in addressing these issues, or is it because they're not addressing these issues at all? What we learned is that it is in fact possible for a student to graduate from the university having not been formally introduced to what the science of climate change might be, let alone what the anticipated impacts of climate disruptions may be to their futures. And that's before we even start to think about how we are equipping students to navigate these, these uncertain futures. So that path brought us here today Krista and I have sort of diverged. We work very closely together. Um, and she has been taken uh, these findings and we recognize that faculty are a front line. Faculty are who are positioned most closely, who have that potential to be in that relationship, that intimate relationship with our students. Um, and so her work has gone on to explore how we can best support faculty. Um, and whereas my work has shifted to really leaning into exploring truth, racial healing, and transformation to understand our complex, our entanglement in complex and unhealthy systems, looking for the root causes and critical leverage points that we can intervene at to become catalysts for systems transformation. It's actually become a major focus of our work in recent years has been the establishment of a Center for Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation. The core of this work is understanding the different isms, racism, colonialism, classism, capitalism, and how we are entangled in this by cultivating reflective practices which invite us to contemplate what our roles and responsibilities to each other could be, um, and helping us deepen our perspectives and aid in our understandings of today. Jennifer, I noticed your comment. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up now. <laughs> Thank you for keeping me on track. Um, so in closing, contrary to, con to popular belief, the root cause of the climate crisis is not greenhouse gas emissions. The root cause of the climate crisis, mass incarceration and police brutality lie in economic system that was created to enrich one group of people through the control, oppression, and exploitation of groups that were deemed to be other. However, the root causes of these crises are not this dominant global paradigm of extractive capitalism. No, um, the root cause of most of the challenges faced by our human and our non-human communities today could only be imposed by a mindset, a worldview, a dominant paradigm, which views peoples and places that are separate from them or other. How else could we treat our human and our non-human families so poorly if we had not somewhere along the lines ourselves been severed from the intimate relationships that your ancestors once held in sacred communion with the very specific places they knew they were descended from. Our separations from ourselves, from being in this intimate relationship, have created conditions that are conducive to the rise of this metastasizing dominant global paradigm, which, which is fueled by extractive and never-ending growth which converts fossil fuels into greenhouse gas emissions with relentless efficiency and in turn drives the biogeochemical composition and the changes in that of our planetary life support systems which bring us today. The root cause of the climate crisis is a false notion that we're separate from the planet, that social and ecosystems are separate and apart. And so many of these contemporary challenges arise from these traumas that we've suffered and continue to express the result of being severed from intimate relationships we once had. So in closing, I wanna close with, share a quote from a, our friend and scholar, Maxine Burkett, who says, my friends, do not lose heart. We were made for these times. I urge you, ask you, gentle you, to please not spend your spirit dry 
by bewailing these difficult times, especially do not lose hope, most particularly because the fact is that you have been made for these times. Yes, for years you have been learning, practicing, been in training for, and just waiting to meet on this exact plane of engagement. There can be no despair when you remember why you came to earth, whom you serve, and who sent you here. The good words we say and the good deeds we do are not ours. They are the words and deeds of the one who brought us here. You are uniquely equipped for these times. As educators, each moment that you teach, you have the power in your hands to shape and shift the mindsets and paradigms out of which the goals, rules, and feedback structure of our entire society emerges. You're amazing, and I'm grateful to be with each and every one of you here today. Mahalo. Thank you, Matthew. Our next speaker, Panupinkala. Hello, greetings from Helsinki. This is what it looks like from above. Uh, I belong to the Feno Agric people, which are sort of strange group of peoples in Europe. There are not many of us, the Finns, the Estonians and the Hungarians. We are originally a forest people, as you can see here. This is the eastern part of our capital where I'm living. It's, there's still a lot of trees, but also in the background there's the commercial international harbor of Helsinki, which binds us to the economy and all its associations. Uh, but I want to begin here with two stories about encounters that I've had on the road. Both of them uh, have happened along an activity that I call the spectrum line of ecological emotions. First, a lakeside and a gravel road. A group of students have been moving along an invisible line in the sand. One emotion word at a time, such as worry or guilt, and then movement along the line. I have asked them to come near the one end of the line if they feel this ecological emotion very often or very strongly. And I have asked them to come to the other end of the line if they feel this eco emotion only rarely or very mildly. After each move, the students discussed with a person close to them. Why am I in this position? How do I think and feel about this emotion? The pair discussion was followed with a joint discussion by the whole group, facilitated by me with a whiteboard for notes. Instructions for active listening had been shared in the beginning and trust had been. Now in this first encounter that I'm telling about, there was a mix of students, half from natural sciences, mostly climate sciences, and half from faculty of arts. This was a summer course, there was plenty of time and that explains the lake. I ran the spectrum line in two parts that enabled the exploration of many emotions. There's a sequence that I usually use with the spectrum line. The instructions are found in my blog and I'll share the link later. Now in this session there was a chance to discuss pride which I had not often done before that. Usually, in relation to other emotions, at least half of the students move near the I feel this strongly end of the spectrum line. But pride was very mixed. A couple of people moved in the strong end, only a couple, while at least half moved very near the opposite end. In the beginning of the discussion, a student about 25 years old bursted out. It's really difficult to feel any pride in whatsoever one does, because one is always part of this human race. Uh, I think that this comment summarizes many important issues. Even persons who really do a lot in relation to environmental issues often feel a very strong sense of inadequacy sometimes shame or so-called species shame, shame simply because they are human. In our spectrum line discussion, others argued that it is only sensible to feel a healthy amount of pride if you value the environment and do many good things. The spectrum line makes possible this kind of dialogic learning. It also provides many opportunities for transformative learning. 
The second story is more brief. It's an encounter inside a university classroom. There was time only for six emotions. Worry, fear, anger, grief, guilt, empowerment. In the anger discussion, a young woman student commented that it is very difficult for her to connect with any anger. I just don't feel it, she said. Instead, I most often feel melancholy. In the next phase, we discussed grief. After that quite emotional discussion, the same student raised her hand again. Now, now I'm beginning to feel my anger, she said. I just found it by discussing deeper the ecological grief that I have. Uh, inside, I was very glad and moved because righteous anger can change the world if it's channeled in a non-violent way. And often grief is the path towards that kind of action. Now, before this racial Cousin Center workshop, I wondered about what should I tell in this opening panel. I've taken part in many projects in Finland related to eco-anxiety. That's not always anxiety, explicitly speaking, but let's talk about that later. And I've done my share of theoretical writing. Elin Kelsey's work was very influential in this in the beginning. Thanks, Elin, Elin for that. And although I've always had a sort of practical purpose also in my theoretical work, some existential dimensions would be very interesting to talk about more. For example, the three types of existential anxiety that philosopher and theologian Paul Tillich discussed seem to be very relevant also in relation to eco-anxiety or climate anxiety. There's anxiety of death and finitude, that was still its first category. The second, anxiety related to guilt and condemnation. And third, anxiety related to meaninglessness and emptiness and sort of depending on the context in which one lives i've seen evidence of all these kinds of existential anxieties related to the ecological crisis but in the end for this panel i decided to focus on these practical examples related to the spectrum line activity i hope that these have given a glimpse of what is possible through activities such as the spectrum line and from your videos i know that many of you have been uh, experimenting with other forms similar to this some students have later sent messages that these workshops have sort of been life-changing experiences because in societies like Finland there's all sorts of socially constructed silence and socially organized defenses around these issues. Naturally, there's much that needs to be said about the use of this method. I have discussed some of these issues in my blog and hopefully we will have a chance to discuss these dynamics in the breakout sessions tomorrow, for example. Uh, the spectrum line does require enough sense of safety, for example, and in some contexts it may require a longer trust building in the beginning than it does in an av average finish setting, for example. Overall, I think that we do need more dialogue with those fields of research and public action which study emotion norms and the so-called cultural politics of, of emo emotion. Who gets a permission to express grief or anger? Uh, are good girls never angry, for example? That's a common emotion norm in, in Finland and in many industrialized societies. And that's a huge problem for many environmental educators, for example, in Finland. They are very out of touch with their anger. Who gets stuck in overemphasized guilt and why? Do the societies around us accept the so only the so-called positive emotions? I'm not at all fond of this separation between so-called positive and negative emotions. It has, has its place, but very often it's connected with cultural prejudices against the so-called negative em emotions. Now, the examples that I mentioned tell some of the ways in which ecological grief, anger and pride get complicated in societies like Finland. Uh, I've seen that there are some quite universal emotional dynamics related to the results of the neoliberal world economic system, but also the, there's profound particularities, and I'm very much looking forward to learning more about them from, from you in this seminar. Now, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop, stop here. Much more could, could be said, but let's discuss more a bit later. Thank you. Thank you, Panu. Um, next, we're going to hear from Francis Roberts Gregory. 
Hello, hi everyone. Really excited to be with you today. I am calling in from New Orleans, also known as, uh, which is a Choctaw word. Um, oh, sorry, Bobancha, also known as Bobancha, which is a Choctaw word, which means land of many tongues. I also want to um, acknowledge the original inhabitants of this land. So yeah, I am an environmental educator, also a graduate researcher. My work focuses on how women of color navigate contradictory relationships with energy and petrochemical industries, as well as how they devise strategies for adaptation, justice, um, and survival. And so what I learned through my doctoral research was that women of color oftentimes work with youth. And I would say that started my journey as an environmental educator. So I previously taught courses on environmental racism and climate justice at Tulane University, as well as Bard Early College New Orleans. And I worked with the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice on their Gulf Equity Water Corps project. I was a project manager and we worked with New Orleans youth, particularly students from New Harmony High, to engage them around sea level rise, um, flooding and strategies for um, just all of the uh, varied environmental issues we experience here in the Gulf South. And so I want to talk a bit about my journey as an environmental educator because methodologically I employ autoethnography and I think that's really important, especially when we're working with students um, and I would say the general population around climate change and engaging with healing strategies. So when I first uh, traveled to Louisiana uh, to work with indigenous um, communities and communities of color, I experienced vicarious trauma because as a scientist, as a person in STEM, I was not trained to engage the subjective, the affective, the emotional. And it really took a few years of uh, coursework in graduate school learning about epistemic injustice, testimonial injustice, hermeneutic injustice for me to even be able to articulate what I was experiencing. Because once again, as a scientist, I'm supposed to be objective. And so once I was able to overcome that, I realized that when you work with frontline communities, when you work with students who deal with intergenerational trauma, you can get tra traumatized yourself. And that also goes for environmental educators, as someone mentioned earlier, who are on the front lines. And so I realized over in time that it was important for me to um, modify my syllabi to employ pedagogical strategies for emotional resiliency um, and also to interrogate some of the norms of a modern education system. So for example, I know that we often champion group work. Group work is great. However, if you've ever worked in a classroom, um, if you do not take the time to build that intentional community, it can actually contribute to harm, especially for students who are engaging um, these very emotional, depressing topics who don't maybe don't have the tools yet to articulate their experiences and also to work collaboratively with others. So intentional community is so important. Also, I realized that we weren't necessarily equipping students with how to deal with uncertainty. And I realized that if I'm a proponent of climate justice, that I really wanted to make sure that my classrooms made students feel good. And so that meant that I needed to focus on pleasure, desire, um, laughter, humor, things of that nature. And so I began nurturing people with food. So this wasn't my idea. I got it from another colleague who's um, getting her PhD in critical education studies, I guess. But nurturing people with food is so important. So every class, every time we had class, I brought food. But this was difficult because since I had not applied for grants previously, you know, I had to go out of my own pocket, <laughs> you know, but that was important in creating that intentional community, that safe space, because my students, if they, they understood that I was nurturing them with food, that I would also nurture their minds and I would also um, try to minimize harm through my content. Also, I tried to meet my students where they are. I engaged social media. Social media is so important. So um, I had uh, used Instagram in order to increase students' critical landscape literacy. So I had students post photos of injustice and in the built environment and the natural environment. And this was very transformative for the students because many of them said that once they saw the photos that they posted and the photos that their peers posted, they could not unsee the injustice. You know, it, it really opened their eyes up to what was going on around them. Also, the use of the visual 
um, sounds, smells, textures. Like I think we really have to engage people, multiple learning styles, and also engage all of the senses if, uh, if we really want to um, minimize the harm that's associated with talking about some of these topics. I think other panelists talked about the importance of honesty. I think honesty is really important. Like I don't try to sugarcoat anything, but I, I do try to have care. And then also uh, action. So all of my courses are service learning courses, or at least they were before COVID. And so the field trips were really important so students could get out in the community. I remember the first day of class, many students said, everything's messed up. Trump is in office. There's nothing we can do about it. And I was like, huh, you think that? So I intentionally tried to uh, introduce them to people born and raised in New Orleans who were actually trying to make a difference because role models representation really matters. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but I would say that I also try to engage creativity. And so like, you know, the first day of class, I asked students to talk about like, what is an environmental superhero? You know, I'm, I'm, what brings you joy? What are you good at? What could you work on? And I think this is important because oftentimes students are afraid to make mistakes, particularly I, I find with Generation Z, not to stereotype, uh, but they're afraid. They're afraid of failure. And if we're going to deal with the uncertainty and fear of climate change, we have to see it as an opportunity for improvisation and also an opportunity for experimentation. So I really try to encourage my students to just let go, be vulnerable, um, and try to create a supportive space for emotions. I really like how some of the previous panelists discussed uh, making space for negative emotions. I think that's so important. Sometimes that even means allowing students to disengage because when students are dealing with multiple traumas and you know, let's say eco-anxiety is not the, I wouldn't even say the primary trauma that students are engaging with all the time. Um, you have to understand that you can plant a seed, but it doesn't necessarily need to bloom in real time in your classroom. So making space for students to engage the, the content on their own terms in their own time is just so important. Of course, I dealt with a lot of challenges as I think all of us educators do. So for example, I use utilize social media. So I dealt with, um, unfortunately, student uh, harassment from a student. I had a student who um, had a hard time balancing just like, you know, all of her commitments and then also just some of the content that we were engaging and, you know, I dealt with cyberbullying, you know, and that's really hard because oftentimes we have protocols in place on how to protect students, but not educators. So I've been thinking critically about how do you support educators? How do you mitigate those risks, but also not turn away from using some of these tools. I see a lot of counselors and therapists using apps like TikTok, which I think is really exciting because they're bringing quality information. Sorry, it's my cat in the background, but they're bringing quality information, but also um, engaging song and dance and, you know, pop culture. So I just think that's really important. Uh, also, I want to just say that I think that for me, healing is my primary objective. And so if trauma is intersectional, I think that healing has to be intersectional, but also intergenerational. I don't think it's fair to expect that students are just going to solve all of these issues. Like that's a lot of pressure. And so I think that we really have to create opportunities for dialogue and spaces where we can unlearn and decolonize together so that we can come up with solutions together. And also think about our, think about the emotional work, emotional labor is 50% of the work that we do, which might mean at times cutting content, which is difficult because I love to saturate my students with content, but you know, I also wanna take, make sure that they're able to absorb it and they're able to feel empowered. Uh, so to conclude, I just in, I want to just encourage all of the educators out there because we're it's really hard work. We don't we're still figuring out the strategies um, and opportunities for uh, emotional resiliency. And I think so important to be reflexive, to embrace vulnerability, and also to be okay with contradictions because our solutions don't have to be perfect, just like our students are not perfect. So I'll conclude with that. Thank you, Francis, and hello to your cat. <laughs> um, and all right, and our our 
final speaker. And after this, we'll allow the um, panelists to respond to each other and then open it up to Q&A for, um, for the rest of our attendees. But our final speaker is Yuan Yuan. Hello, everyone. So I'm saying hi from Shanghai. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so people may ask, ask me the question, what is the status quo of Chinese students' emotional response to climate change? Well, honestly, I haven't done any statistical analysis as uh, Matthew did. My reflections come from the students' response in the university where I teach. But, um, okay, uh, let me do it in this way. But I argue that uh, whatever their emotional response is, since China is the largest greenhouse gas emitter, and since there's no required course for climate change education uh, in Chinese system at present, teachers have the responsibility to infuse this topic in whatever courses they teach. And uh, when we teach, two differences should be highlighted. Um, one is regional differences, the other is personal differences. Generally speaking, Chinese students are not as sensitive and anxious about climate change as their European counterparts, but that does not mean they're not concerned or worried. Students in the city have more awareness and knowledge about climate change than their rural counterparts, and they vary from one to another yeah. in the degree of worry, fear, and anxiety. That requires climate change educators to work out tailor-made strategies to navigate students' emotional responses. As a college English teacher uh, with 16 year teaching experience in Shanghai, I wanna share my thoughts and practices about climate change education in which I have been engaged. First, where does the fear of climate change come from? I have a small group of graduate students I supervise. We focus on the reading of climate fiction and eco-critical works this is a seminar of, uh, for English majors. It's academically oriented. The problem is many students feel discouraged and upset by reading climate fiction that describe a dark future with water shortage, ethical and moral defiance, species extinction, which are helpful for creating epiphanies in literature, but distressful for readers and researchers. Since in this problem, I asked a colleague, Professor Lai Xing from Department of Mechanics for help. His specialty is electronic vehicle battery management. He helped me readjust the students' emotional orientation. Students always want new faces. So he gave them brief lectures about clean energy, Q&A about how scientists have been trying to help build a brighter future for the planet. That helps ease the tension between students and climate change narrative texts. Here I want to say that our students' fear and anxiety do not necessarily come from climate change itself. They come from climate change narratives instead. Fiction, films, documentaries, media reports, activist talks, etc. So it's the influence of the influence which creates a double pressure on students. I'm not blaming the creative writers or art producers for alarming the general public, as well as policymakers with post-apocalyptic narratives. But it's like the culture of fear after September the 11th terrorist attack. The recurring images of melting icebergs, climate disasters like hurricanes, tsunamis and fires, and different endangered animals, easily, quickly, and repeatedly transmitted through WeChat, YouTube, and many other media forms all contribute to this new culture of fear. That presents a serious challenge to climate educators worldwide. So one of the possible solutions may be to shift gears and help our students get in touch with different materials rather than being immersed in climate change narratives and relevant critical works, a lot of which prove to be pessimistic and extinction oriented. So Second, uh, a, a comparative reading method that I've been conducting with English major undergraduates in a course titled Selected Reading of British and American Newspapers and Magazines. So this is not a course called Climate Change or Environmental Studies, 
but teachers can decide what materials students read and discuss. I assign articles about climate change from China Daily, National Geographic, and the Los, Los Angeles Times for my students to have a comparative reading. I divided them into groups and asked them to find the similarities and differences between climate change reports in Chinese and Western media. Each group will give a presentation with a summary of group members' responses, both academically and emotionally. For instance, one group focused on reports about Fridays for Future, the climate protest led by Greta Thunberg. That group of students shared their compassion with their European counterparts um, in their appeal for climate action, but they expressed a greater willingness to really do something practical rather than playing truant on school days. So back to my first point, regional differences and uh, personal differences are crucial. Uh, we have the Confucian wisdom of yin cai shi jiao, meaning teaching students according to their aptitude. It is applicable when we try to help our students navigate their emotional responses to what climate change and climate change narratives. Third, um, the cross-disciplinary approach that I've been using for all levels of English learners, including, uh, including undergraduates and postgraduates of different academic backgrounds. Besides inviting my colleague from Department of Mechanics for help, I also invite my friends who do public litigation at Shanghai Railway to participate in our teaching program. So they share the litigation process of environmental legal cases along the Yangtze River, the longest river in China, especially those cases near Shanghai. Students get to know how the government institutions have been working to protect biodiversity. For example, punishing illegal fishing with electoral house that may destroy the biodiversity of the perching waters for the Chinese sturgeons. They got to learn that the government is now trying to make up for the environmental losses that we have suffered in the past decades, which is somewhat soothing for them and makes them less angry about the things we could have done better. It may be considered hope in despair. I mainly use short videos recorded by the public litigators and share information about legal cases and relevant knowledge from the official WeChat account with my students. Students can post them with their responses in WeChat moments and forward them to various WeChat groups, which helps to popularize the environmental law and raise the awareness for the protection of biodiversity in a larger social community. By doing that, students feel a sense of involvement and care in environmental protection and learn to share the responsibility of digital community building with the common aim for a shared future. The traditional Chinese poem goes like this, No matter we live in the upper reaches or the lower reaches of the Yangtze River, we share the same water or it. Um, to conclude, I want to emphasize that we need to help our students acknowledge the fact that climate change mitigation is a long process and help them get prepared for climate disasters, both intellectually and emotionally. If we cannot change climate change instantly, we'll need to learn how to live with it by adapting to it. It's quite similar to the case of COVID-19. It might be the worst, yet not uh, yet the most practical strategy for now. And thank you. Thank you, Yuan. So, We've gone just a, a little bit over for the panelists, which is fine. I think what we'll do um, possibly, and Sarah, you can nod if this sounds good, is maybe uh, just 10 minutes for the panelists to ask some questions from each other or respond to each other briefly um, as you wish. And then that'll still give us uh, 30 minutes for uh, the Q&A from the audience. So, and our panelists, you can um, either raise your hand or unmute yourself to indicate if you'd like to speak, ask a question, or respond to another panelist.
<laughs> yeah, well, well, I can start to break the silence, although silence is a good method also in in existential, emotional, environmental education, I, I, I think. Th thank you all for my, my part. It's it's fascinating and, and already I think this network work aspect has at least cheered me up here here in the in the midst of still some COVID res restrictions. Um, this finding meaning uh, I, I've been thinking a lot, lot about, and of course, Ellen Kelsey has been writing on this for a long time and several others, others here. I read some of uh, text related to Ma Matthew and, and Krista, for example, and, you know, there's the, uh, there's the shock of, you know, reading information about how bad the state of the ecological systems really, really is. And of course, that brings the challenges to how we use hope language and Sarah Ray is discussing this a lot in, in her, her new book also. So I just wanted to comment and raise up this issue of, you know, finding me meaning. Of course, there's a long strand of existential thoughts and existential psychology, including Viktor Frankl and logotherapy and this. But, but uh, uh, I sometimes have the feeling that uh, for example, in my work, I use the word hope, for, but what I really mean is finding finding meaning. So, just some comments and lifting this team up. Mahalo, Panu. I'm I'm going to jump in. I have a I have a question to all of my fellow panelists. Um, my question is actually around how each of you cultivate practices of self-care? What are the things that you do? Um, I went through some pretty heavy depression last year as I was moving through my own personal ecological grief. And so that gauntlet that my team ran along right side with me and my family and my loved ones has given us specific tools to help support others to move through that process. But I, I think that's something that we don't talk about often enough. And so I'm just really curious to hear um, what are what has been a key personal practice to to be able to take care of yourselves as you're holding all of this for for your students and i would say for this one just jump in maybe two or three folks can respond and and we can make sure we can get to ellen's question too how does that sound okay yeah so i guess i can start i think when I was teaching, I honestly wasn't doing the best job of, with self-care. Um, it's just very stressful teaching. <laughs> uh, but I think over time, I've learned that it's important to, uh, I don't know, I feel like, I, I can only speak for myself, I feel like sometimes I over-prepare. Like, I feel like I have to cover every topic. Like, I need to make sure that all my students' needs are met. So I actually, like, intentionally not preparing as much or under preparing was actually really helpful in terms of my self care. Um, and like not feeling like I have to stick to a schedule like allowing things to flow more in the classroom. That was really important. I think lately I've been getting more into like meditation, self awareness, um, daily walking. Um, there's this organization called Girl Trek, um, the United States. Well, I guess they might be international, but they've been doing this 21 day walking challenge. So that's been really helpful for me to like reduce my screen time. So yeah, I would say I'm still a work in progress, but oh, and also like humor. I like share a lot of funny memes. Um, I follow a lot of therapists on, on social media um, and that's really, really helpful. And I find that when I post those memes, it's helpful for others, uh, for students as well as um, just my friends and followers. Ellen, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I just wanted to touch on both of the questions. So Panu, I really appreciate your question about meaning and its relationship to hope. And I, I think one of the things I find intriguing is that when we speak about hope, we often think of it in a future orientation. You know, what possibilities exist, what might change. And from the palliative care literature, uh, hope is much more about a meaningful present. And I think that um, many of us today have been talking about presence and being in um, mindfulness moments and those sorts of things. So I think you're quite right that that experience between meaning and hope, I, I think, are so strongly interlinked. 
Um, and then to comment on self-care, I think it extends from that same place. I was really touched by Matthew, you're talking about our, our, our stretch away from the uh, natural world in which we all live. And I think the thing that is most important to my self-care, you'll notice I'm outside. Um, I, I really have been almost living outside in this last year. I sleep outside, I shower outside, I work outside. And I, I find that to be incredibly um, restorative uh, because it keeps me really in touch with changes that are happening around me. And I, I just think it has a, a huge benefit that um, just, just as Leslie spoke about, I'm not even sure I could articulate. So for me, that's really helpful. And the other thing is I very actively pursue solutions-oriented media um, as, as a regular part of what I'm taking in on an everyday basis. And, um, and I work in a lot of collaborations and I think hope is very collective. And so I, all of those contribute to my self-care. Thank you. Would any of the other panelists like to speak to Matthew's question? I, I also invited people in the chat to join in on their answers so we can collectively gather some of these strategies that everybody's deploying in their own lives. Any other panelists though? Um, I guess my go-to um, is a form it's a, like a meditative form I don't quite know what to call it but um, it's like a, a, a kind of deep listening because what it helps me do I, I focus so much on the different layers so it starts with the body awareness it includes tuning into the environment and what you know like mindfulness what the sensations are where I may be resting but then it helps me see what my mind might have grabbed onto and it's just like chewing away like a dog on a bone. And sometimes there's a humor in recognizing it so clearly, as well as the opportunity to let that go. And then this listening part, there's often this bubbling up of um, kind of a fresh perspective. You know, like one that seems to be whispered in my ear so often is, you know, you're not Atlas, you know, stop trying to think you're carrying this whole, you know, world yourself, you know, and again, it comes with kind of a sweet humor, but it's the reminder that I personally need, and it's very um, alive, so it's not always the same, but um, it uses, it taps into a little bit of all those different levels, so I just find it extremely helpful. Great, Sarah, we have quite, we've got a few questions going in the q and I wonder if we wanna to jump to some of those. Yeah, sure. Um, and in, um, in the spirit of the um, round table, the panelists being able to pick up threads or speak to each other, feel free to continue to do that. We'll just kind of bounce back and forth here now with some of the questions coming in from the rest of the participants. And I want to acknowledge the, the sort of um, incredible uh, wealth of expertise around self-care and these strategies that is in the participant list too. So um, please feel free in the chat to record some of your strategies and your ideas and maybe some responses to what's, what you're hearing here. Um, so for the, in the Q&A, just a reminder for the technology of this, if you want to ask a question in the Q&A, please click on the Q&A box and, and, and write one in there. Or if you'd like to raise your, your blue hand on the, in the actual participant list, we can call on you and you can speak for yourself and we'd love to see your face and hear your voice. So um, if you are willing to do that, please just go ahead and raise your hand. It, it causes your name to come up to the top of our list and we can easily answer, uh, pick on you. And so I see there's one, um, one, a couple of hands coming up and I'm just gonna call on them and I'll intersperse with some of the Q&A that's been written, okay? So go ahead, Jessica. Hey folks, this is so great. It's been really wonderful to hear from everybody, uh, even if we can't physically be together. Uh, so I'm a game designer and I work on uh, impact gaming and games around complex subject matter. And so it's really, really lovely hearing about how playfulness is working its way into uh, climate education. And so I'm curious what's been working or not working for folks? Are you, are you seeing ways in which play is really resonating or are there things that you have developed that you feel really proud of and would love to see disseminated further?
just jump in? Or is that directed yeah. to anyone yes, specifically? Yeah. That's to <laughs> Sorry, everyone. we're all waiting Sorry. for each other to go. We're figuring it out as we go here. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll just jump in to break the awkward silences. Um, so play, yes. Um, and that's been something that I've been trying to cultivate myself and not be so damn serious all the time and feel like I have to be working on solutions. Um, so I have no time to start a radio show, but I did at our you know, college station, because it's a silly thing that gives me joy. Related to students, um, some of the most compelling um, and exciting initiatives um, are around sort of like, we, we have a, a new initiative that we launched, sorry to use this pun again, new initiative called New Futures, um, but we spell new K-N-E-W. So we're remembering ways that we have forgotten. Um, to create really generative, playful spaces to bring your ideas to fruition. So it's not a business incubator, it's an ideas incubator. And all of the ideas, because this is students live context, interestingly, they're solving really specific things. And it's all the way from, you know, app and game design to um, events and, you know, social um, sort of initiatives to legitimate sort of um, social um, social enterprises. Go ahead, Leslie. Okay. Um, one of the things in trauma theory is to go to toggle back and forth between touching on deep emotions or difficult things and then bringing either a remembered strength or it could be a playfulness. So I wanted to mention a specific thing that's really fun to do. It can be done with an individual. It can be done in a group. And um, it's just called the doggy shake. And so you have everyone stand up for a minute and just recall when a dog is all wet and wants to dry off, how it kind of starts this shimmy from the top of its head down to its tail and out its paws. And we just have everybody do that, you know, using their own range of of movement and holding onto a chair if needed, but just kind of this playful shaking it all off and to do it slowly and then have it go faster, faster, faster. And usually by the end, people are laughing because it's such a silly thing to do. But in truth, it taps into um, the playfulness. It taps into what we know a little bit about shaking and trauma release. There's kind of a lot, a lot in there. So I think there's also ways to just kind of intersperse things like that um, in kind of any context. Is anybody else in a great play? I think Francis was the one to speak most about that. And if you feel like getting into more detail, we can do that before we go into the next question. I mean, I would just say quickly, I'm still learning. Like I really, really wanted to include like uh, video games in my class, my classroom. I didn't actually make it that far just because of time constraints with the semester. Um, but yeah, play is so important. Uh, and so I find that my students really like uh, debates, role playing, and also scavenger hunts. Um, there's something about even like, I mean, I don't know if this is playful, but even like quizzes sometimes in the morning. <laughs> just like, well, I have like open note reading quizzes. So it's, it's, it's just really just to make sure that they're, they, I don't know, they just like searching for information, like the whole point of like the scavenger hunt really appeals to a lot of students. So I find that's really effective with my, um, I should say my early college high school students. Great, thank you. Um, we also have, a, so we had a question from um, Munaza Yakub. And I don't know if her hand is up. Let's see, Munaza, I'm gonna see if I can find you here. Sarah. There was two, there are two people who wanna ask the question basically for strategies for students or in educational context where environmental and climate change is not, in, not really included or skeptical students. So um, Munaza's question was like that. And I think uh, there was another person who asked that. So okay. we could combine them in, in terms of the panelists. Do you have strategies for sort of um, reticent audiences? And Munaza can speak for herself now. She's come to the top. <laughs> uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you very much for responding to my question. A very interesting discussion, I'll be brief. My question is that there are societies like ours where environmental, environmental degradations, they are not considered issues serious enough to be included in curriculums of the schools and even at higher education. And they are not the part of the pedagogical practices in general, except people particularly who, are, who have chosen this field as the field of their research and they have developed a few courses for their own self, just like me. But even then people who are conducting their research at PhD level and other, they are not uh, uh, received well. It's not, they are not encouraged. It's still not considered a field uh, serious enough for the academic research and the other. This is the scenario at the higher education because I am teaching at the university. So you can trickle it down to the schools and you can feel that uh, at the primary and the secondary level where this education must be uh, a uh, mandatory education and my mental, it's not there except a few very, very elite public schools. So I would, after listening to the discussions and the issues which you have been discussing, I think we need uh, perhaps level three, level four or level five, we are still at the level one or two. So I would like uh, if uh, you could suggest some ways how to raise the environmental consciousness at that level, what to do. Because what I can do is that my students are university students who will go to the uh, education sector after some years, maybe as teachers. So I can do something with them. Uh, and I will welcome your suggestions for that. Thank you for your time. And by the way, Munaza is joining us from Pakistan. Um, you end not to put you on the spot, but I think this is a, a, a question that really okay. resonates with the, you know, what you were sharing about um, um, right. academic culture in China. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to do, yeah, I think uh, there is a similar case in China because uh, climate change education is not considered compulsory at present, and um, at least at present. And um, in college education, we don't have courses that are called climate change or uh, environmental humanities. So it's like um, the teachers need to have their awareness themselves. For me, I am a, um, I, I'm a researcher of literature and I'm working on uh, climate fiction. So um, I'm trying to, aware, uh, to, to raise the awareness of myself and of my colleagues, but it's true that it is difficult um, well, um, I, I don't know what is the case in Pakistan. Well, in, in China, like um, a lot of students, you know, uh, so they, they, uh, the awareness is, not, is really not very strong. So um, when we are talking about navigating students' emotional response, I think um, I need to go back to the presentation uh, which I did. That is the uh, regional difference and personal difference. So for those students who uh, read a lot of, the, for example, comic fiction and get in touch with a lot of uh, the re uh, media reports, um, they might have this kind of fear or anxiety. But for some of the students, they still believe, they, they still don't believe in the scale effect. And um, it's, it's, unfortunately, it's, it's the case. So in that case, um, I think when we are devising our syllabus, especially um, in my country, um, about 90% of college students would uh, have English as their required course in college. So I think um, college English classes are uh, one of the best arenas for us to infuse climate change education if it's not uh, the required course, if it's not the uh, compulsory in, in uh, the system. So um, I would choose um, like reports about climate change, like what I did in my course, uh, selected readings of um, American and British um, media reports, and uh, so it's like um, magazines and newspapers uh, reports. And I would ask them, ask my students to have a comparative reading of all these reports because I want um, my students to know to get to the, um, the whole picture instead of just one part of the picture. And I would initiate discussions. And uh, like, uh, like the previous speaker said, uh, I would have the debate. I would also have them to debate on the issues 
because sometimes um, climate issues are very complex, complicated. Like, um, like in China, when we're having the Three Gorges Dam, and so it's like we're, we're trying to generate hydropower, but it also does harm to those people who are living or who lived in the sacrifice zones. So I would initiate talks, I would initiate um, debates for my students. And the students, after the debate, they would get to know this and they might do some further research. And I would ask them to give um, presentations and also write papers. And in that case, I help my students to, have to, to uh, raise their awareness. I think, uh, to conclude, uh, anyway, so it's like the teachers need to have their awareness themselves. And then in that case, we can help our students to get the awareness. So I have a question for Matthew. Just now, I, you know, um, you talked about faculty support. Um, I, don't, I don't really understand. So it's like uh, you support the faculty, you train the faculty to be climate educators, or you help them so, you, you help these faculty members to overcome the fear and anxiety of them. So it's like, um, yeah. It's a, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, my colleague, Krista Heiser, probably answered it better than I could, um, but like, she's hosting one of the breakouts and as that's her primary focus of her work. So I'll give a brief answer. Um, really what we've been focusing on is teaching affectively. Um, so equipping faculty with more tools to be able to access different frameworks to be able to help their students move through those emotions. So it's Acknowledging the emotions is a start. Um, moving through it, hope is active. Um, and connecting them to service learning and to communities who are you know, actively involved, all the things that you folks said. Um, but the, the, I guess the simplest answer I can give is it starts with acknowledging that A, faculty need support, <laughs> and B, what type of support that is, which is more of the touchy-feely stuff that administrators don't you know, tend to get. Um, but we really hold the line on that and are really intentional to create and hold those sacred protected spaces to be able to nurture ourselves and each other. I'd like to add one thing to this conversation too. Um, prior to doing what I'm doing now, I worked in a hospital system where I was helping to bring in an integrative holistic medicine program really early in the days of that. And one thing I found really helped, and it might be a model that could be translated to some of these institutional settings, was partnerships. So I found, for example, an MD who was very um, supportive of this idea, head of cardiology. So he was the one who spoke to his peers, uh, which was much better received than a social worker type in this particular institution. I found, um, at an, a hospital administrator who was very receptive. And once there was this team where I was building a lot of the clinical material, but they were pulling funds and opening doors and challenging their peers, it just, the movement really accelerated. So kind of back to the importance of networking, partnerships, collaboration. I have, I've just seen that in action, especially in bringing in um, new ideas and programs into very staid, traditional and hierarchical systems. Thank you. So we, we have four more hands up and I'll let you know if we're going to be calling on you. Uh, first Heidi Danzel, then Jennifer Ladino, Jill Gatlin, and Terry Harpold. So Heidi, I'm going to allow you to talk here and, and share your question. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hello everybody. I'm sitting at the Rachel Carson Center where you're supposed to be now. So it's uh, cloudy outside and uh, it was supposed to rain, but the weather forecast was wrong as usual. Um, I wanted to ask one question, which uh, I am dealing with on a PhD level. I'm looking at resilience in fiction in global environmental novels. And I sometimes get the feedback that adaptation is a better term 
than Vestilians because Vestilians has been kind of gobbled up by a new liberal, you know, forces kind of saying, you know, don't worry about all the problems, just get stronger and overcome them. So how do you deal with this uh, negative connotation of resilience? And um, do you still think it's the better term of the two to use? Or do you think we should move to a totally new term altogether? Resilience versus adaptation. That's right. I'm going to jump in because I was actually typing my answer to your question in the Q&A. So not to repeat what's already there, but maybe just to expand upon it. Um, I, binaries to me are really problematic because they're restrictive. Um, and I've just recently stumbled across um, a really incredible thinker. Um, so I shared a link to Jordan Hall's post on anti-fragility. Um, for me, um, adaptation starts from that like sober reality that we need to adapt. Whereas resilience is this sort of stubborn insistence that we can and should rebound or recover to quote unquote normal uh, normalcy. And that's highly problematic. Um, it does have a place. There, there is a function for resilience in certain discussions at city planning levels and whatnot. And concurrently, we need to have, uh, we need to expand our conversations if we're going to create conditions to cultivate a shift in our paradigms, in our consciousness, in our um, the, the mental construct that expresses as the physical societies that we're entangled in. Um, so I just want to read from Jordan's post is robustness is when you shove me, I remain unmoved. When resilience is when if you shove me, I, I return to my original position. And transmorgification or anti-fragility talks about transmorgification, transmutation, transformation. This time when you shove me, I, invade, I invent something new. I invent Aikido. Um, and that to me is a portal to much more generative conversations and much more options. Can I just say one more thing about this? Can I say one more thing about it? No, me, me. me. Oh, oh, please. Yeah. Um, I just, you know, uh, Leslie was saying before that now we are defining resilience from a, from a new perspective where it's not about going back to normal, but, you know, getting this kind of resilient mindset. And this is actually the term I'm working with because I think resilient, to me, it means that you have a situation and then you invent a new so the question here is again, um, can we redefine resilience or would it be smarter to use a new term? Maybe that is my question. Because, um, yeah, because of the negative baggage of resilience. And maybe Leslie, you have a comment on that or anybody else. But thank you, Leslie. I, I guess I, I'm just living with the question as well rather than having an answer because Part of the challenge is that even if we rename it, because Matthew, in your description, it was the third term that's most closely matched to my impression of resilience. So even that, you know, may be more descriptive if you hear the definition. Is it a familiar word? No. So then it still needs all, all the explanation, too. I think, um, Again, it's probably just that we do have a lot of personal associations with the words, either for the better or for the worse. Uh, I like resiliency because, um, you know, as you were saying, there's this kind of aliveness to it. You know, it's evolving. And while there is, um, that has to happen in adaptation too, for me, there's kind of this landing component. We've adapted, you know, we may have to adapt again. But um, for me, resiliency has a little more of that buoyancy that, um, and the immediacy that I appreciate. Yeah, I, I love this question, Heidi, and I, I have thought a lot of thoughts on it too, but I will withhold my thoughts in the spirit of knowing that we have three more questions and I do wanna make sure that Jennifer has a few minutes just to describe what's, what's happening next for this workshop. So um, Jen Ladino, um, I'm going to un I'm going to allow you to talk. Can you ask your question? Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hey everyone, how's greetings from Moscow, Idaho? I, my initial post only went to the panelists. Sorry about that. 
Um, I'm at the University of Idaho. I'm a professor in the English department here and feeling very remote in our very small rural town uh, these days. So it's really great to see folks from around the world here. Oh, I'm getting a coffee delivery. Thank you for my eight-year-old. Leslie, I'll be really looking forward to your book for eight to 12-year-olds since I have an eight and a 12-year-old uh, currently. Thank you, Ben. Um, anyway, so my question, um, I have questions for each of you, but obviously I will not ask them all, but thank you all so much for your amazing and really exciting and inspiring presentations. Um, I'm trying to pose a kind of broad question that any of you might want to speak to, but it comes most directly from Matthew's presentation. Um, I was really taken with the chart that showed the different percentages of emotions among students at, at the University of Hawaii. Um, and with the word dissonance, which is something I've thought about in my own work, I like to use the phrase affective dissonance, and I'm not sure if that means different things to different people. Um, so a couple questions related to that. Does that, this, and I define that as basically having mixed, often conflicting feelings about something. And I've worked with it mostly in the realm of sort of tourism, um, but I'm very interested in it as it relates to climate change emotions as well. Um, so does this dissonance register, and you can take this for, um, to be about your research, about your students, about your teaching or about you, does that dissonance register as anxiety? Is it a feeling of overwhelmingness? Um, or just sort of tension? Is there some other word that you would use to describe it? And then I heard Matthew talk about resonance, which seemed to imply a kind of resolution. And I think you even said, Matthew, a, a need to resolve the dissonance. And so I'm curious with, if other people have thoughts about that. Is that the goal to sort of resolve it or to sort of learn to live with it and manage it in healthier ways? Um, and another kind of way to think about this is sort of what is anxiety or what is the relationship between dissonance and anxiety? So I'll stop there. Thanks everyone. Thank you for a great question. I feel like I've soaked up an awful lot of space here, so I actually want to open up to my fellow panelists first sure. before responding. Thanks. It's yeah, Alan. I thought you would have a thought oh, about sorry. anxiety. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thanks. That's fa fascinating. Um, I really like this affective dissonance term because I think one of the very wide scale problematic notions in contemporary world is related to, to cognition and it's closely tied with those interpretations of, of emotional intelligence which tend to be you know control it with your rational intelligence to, to put it a bit roughly um, but so I think there's uh, and the question of how our rationality and intuition or emotions are related to each other. I don't think that's in any way solved. And for the new book about Enigma of Human Reason, for example, is very interesting in this, this, this regard. And very often I see, you know, diminution of the affective and emotional dimension in, in various view, viewpoints. And that's something I think we need to need to op oppose. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about various definitions of anxiety. I'm not going to start lecturing about that, <laughs> that, that here, uh, but I'll just mention one more term, which is dissociation. And it can be in a very everyday sense contrasted with association. So I, what, I, what I see a lot of happening with students and environmentalists and you name who is that the, the pressures and contradictions and ambivalence are, that's so strong that people to dissociate and there can be all kinds of you know dissociative moves and and some of the old psychological stuff related to dissociation even some of the you know contrasted classics like Carl Gustav Jung I find very interesting in relation to this dissociation as association thing so just some remarks a very good question thank you thanks so we, we have 10 minutes left. So I think we just have time for one more question. Um, so Jill, I'm gonna put you live and then Terry Harpold, I, we didn't get to your question. If you wanna type it to the panelists, maybe we can, uh, they can respond to that in the chat. And I apologize for that, but I wanna leave the last five minutes to talk about what we're gonna be doing tomorrow and in the days to come. So, and before you go to Jill, I just want to let everyone know I'm hearing everybody's requests for the slides from panelists and to capture the Q&A in the chat. And I'm just want to let everyone to know that I'm going, I'm doing all, trying to get all that done. So just. If you don't all mind, just 
a few more emails from us that will include <laughs> all of that. The, the chat discussion is just so rich and I think that'd be great to make available to everyone. Okay, Jill, can we hear you? Hi, am I on? Yeah. Yes. Thank you all so much. I just had a quick practical question and I also um, posted it in the Q&A, but that's how you balance um, this direct attention to emotional reflection with other course content that you have to teach, whether that's in a 50 minute class period or on a weekly or semester long basis. So I can try to answer that really, really quickly. Um, so I feel like in any course, there's certain things you, you kind of skim the surface and certain things you go deeper on. And so for me, I said, what do I want my students to take away? And I said, really critical thinking about the environment and also feeling empowered that they can make a change. And so um, I think, at least for me as an academic, sometimes we write books about topics that really could be covered in like a page. And so if I want my students to know a lot of studies, I might like say a sentence or two or watch like a three minute video like we'll watch like maybe five or six videos that are really short for like the general public so they can get like a lot of different examples but then i'll spend more time on the emotions and like the critical content um and then also i just uh someone else had asked a related question about like bringing in environmental justice and empowering students i think that you know every class that i teach like if i talk about you know, what's going on like in Cancer Alley, then I bring in a guest speaker who's talking about how they're fighting the petrochemical company. So like, I feel like I'm always trying to, my, my course is focused on activism. So I'm always uh, centering activists. And then someone else asked about um, bringing in food and senses in the um, sensory um, ways of engaging in the classroom during COVID or virtually. I think that's where labs come in and social media and having students um, have like, uh, like a collaborative Instagram account or even a collaborative blog where they can show pictures or videos of them engaging different foods, you know, so I think labs come in handy. So that's my, that's my comments on a lot of questions. Okay, so Jen, do you want to wrap wrap up? And I'm and I'm I'm looking also at the in the chat. There's some really good ideas, including um, starting a LinkedIn group and a, a Twitter hashtag to be for this group. Um, so we will run with all of those things. Those are great ideas. I mean, I think I mentioned it in the introductory comments that a primary purpose of this is to build a network and see what unfolds and where that goes from here. Uh, any existential toolkit that we build together it certainly is only the beginning of, of these possible connections and resource sharing, so. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm thinking my, my closing remarks are really only two minutes long. So we have three more minutes that Terry could ask his question if we wanted to take one more. Okay. Terry, are you willing to, here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna allow you to talk. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a it's a it's a it's a tremendous honor to to hear all of you speak. It's been very exciting. I was trying to type hurriedly into the uh, chat. My basic question has to do with the reality of developing an intentional community within the constraints of the pandemic. Um, I really appreciate what Francis said about intentional the classroom as an intentional community, the university as an intentional community, and a community. An intentional community operates both at the level of ethos or concept and of material practice. And one of the things that I've done in my classes in the past is that we've been reading, focusing a lot on trees. So we read fiction by Ursula K. Le Guin and Richard Powers. We read John Muir and we, we look at, the, at, uh, at um, the, the paintings of Emily Carr, a Canadian painter of the last century, the poetry of Judith Wright and so on. Um, and then we plant trees. I work with the, with the local arborist of our county to plant trees in underserved communities or under-treed nearby communities. And the students go out in the field and literally get their hands dirty. And uh, the tree planting is not <clears throat> a supplement to the classroom or an extra credit activity. It's, it's, it is the embodied extension of the discussions and the readings. It works very well. It's gonna be impossible to do that under the realities of virtual teaching in the fall, when because of the pandemic constraints, we, we are not able to be engage in embodied praxis, either in the classroom or in the field. And, and what I'm struggling with in designing, redesigning 
my classes for the fall is how to incorporate that kind of embodied um, that, that kind of embodied intervention or something like that embodied intervention that aligns with the intellectual, the ethical, and the affective discussions that we have in the classroom regarding the literature and the poetry and the art. And I would really welcome some suggestions for how to work um, in, in this, in, within the constraints of the pandemic to actually get students to make changes, not just talk about them in any field that that would work in. So please, I welcome your wisdom and your advice. Um, it's Ellen and I just had a quick answer to that. I just finished trying to teach a field school online. And um, one of the things that was really helpful was um, having students use WhatsApp, uh, which they're really familiar with, many students, uh, so that they were individually, I'm just thinking they would be individually planting a tree where they could. And there are all these uh, fantastic apps now to show where trees are needed and, and where they're best uh, served. And, but they were speaking to each other through WhatsApp at the same time. So they were having a collective experience that they could individually carry out. So that's just cool. one thing I found useful. I'll jump in real quick too. So um, a decade ago, I had an experience de de developing and designing online coursework for for permaculture design. And so how do you reconcile teaching virtually in an asynchronous module, something that is like literally about the conscious design of generative and regenerative systems. And so everything, anytime we met virtually, it was to share experiences of field work that we had assigned for them to go out, walk your neighborhood and observe um, the fruit trees or edible species that are in your neighborhood, share, reflect, come prepared to share back so small tactical piece. Wonderful. But, uh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yes. So uh, I just a uh, very quick response. It's like if we can, if we can plant real trees, that's best. If we cannot, we can use some digital ways. Like in China, we have uh, like digital uh, that platform um, provided by Alibaba, Taobao. So uh, you plant a digital tree. Actually, that kind of uh, digital planting is to donate some money, like um, 10 yuan or um, 20 yuan. So by doing that, uh, we can also contribute to um, the ecological protection. Thank you. I, I just love the notion of, of ending on the note of planting trees. I think that's apt for, for this panel. Um, so, so I want to thank our panelists again and everybody who has joined us today. There are plenty more opportunities to participate. Um, if you have already signed up for one of the breakout sessions tomorrow, um, uh, if, or if you haven't joined up for signed up for other breakout sessions, please email Sarah Jaquette Ray, um, and she can give you the, the Zoom links. Um, all of the pa all of those breakout sessions are really um, going to be addressing the same issue, but in different time zones around the world. And so it's an opportunity for people to identify what can they contribute right now. It could be a podcast, a book, a documentary, uh, a tree planting app. Um, what, how can we take what we already have right now, um, contribute that to the toolkit to make that publicly available? But then in those discussions also identify what is missing? Um, what do you still need to support your teaching and your work and your activism? And then when the core group comes back together on Sunday, we're gonna sort of look through the notes on all of those conversations and try to identify both what we wanna surface and what, where there might be some gaps that we wanna fill in. Um, and then we'll be communicating with all of you to let you know what comes out of this and what are some of the next steps, whether that is um, a, a, a conference, uh, um, um, more online resources, and, and hopefully in many different forms, um, opportunities to, to network and to, to become a stronger community um, among all of us. Um, Sarah, do you have any, any last words you wanna say about the breakout session or what's, what's next? Yes, my email is sarah.ray at humboldt.edu, and I've been putting that in the, um, quite a few times in the chat, but let me know if you'd be interested in joining a breakout session. We have six, I believe, scheduled uh, all times of the day tomorrow. 
So that hopefully that will cover somebody in the time zone and they're two hours long and you can just join the email I'll send you will have the Zoom links for all of those sessions. So you can join whichever one works for you. And um, there, is, there will be designated facilitators for most of them. We added an extra one in case there was a lot of overflow from this session of interest. So there's one session at 9 a.m. Pacific time that doesn't have a designated facilitator, but there are notes in the email I'll send about how to manage the time and what we're hoping that will come out of these sessions so that we can have a report out to the um, core group in, on Sunday, um, which is our final day. And other than that, what I'm hearing from folks is that there's a lot of interest in um, strategies about building community within this group and building a network of resources and knowledge sharing. And so my, my um, initial thought, my initial response is that's really what we wanted to generate. This is one of the reasons why it's so exciting that we could go online. And if you have some initiative about LinkedIn or some other connection, please go ahead and, and do it. And, and we can send a list of emails and get this network kind of going, but if you would like to share in some of the um, work of building that and have some knowledge about some of these platforms, by all means, I'd love, uh, I'd love your help. Wonderful. Well, that takes us right to, to 1002. So again, I want to thank everybody who contributed, our panelists, our contributors, Rachel Carson Center at the University of Washington, Anna Thompson, um, and I look forward to seeing everybody in the days to come and beyond. So. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. <laughs>